I'm Cynthia James, and this network is about changing lives one woman at a time. Welcome to Women Awakening. I'm your host, Cynthia James, and I get the distinct honor of introducing you to women. Fabulous women who are change makers, way showers, entrepreneurs, but most importantly, they are here to make a difference on this planet. And so they show us that they're not the exception, that they are an example of what's possible for all of us. I believe that on this time on the planet, there's a lot that tells us it's time for women to emerge, to bring our light, our love, our peace, our harmony, our grace, and our nurturing to move the planet from the tendency towards war to the tendency towards love. So um, I'm grateful we do this uh, every Friday. So you can come back every week and meet a new incredible woman. Subscribe. We're on Spotify, iTunes, iHeart, Spreaker. We're on YouTube and video. And so I would love for you to come tell other people, share the videos, because every single woman is someone that inspires me. Today, I have uh, a guest that I met at a conference uh, earlier in the year. Her name is Kate Lynch Bolduck. And she's a former uh, Fortune 100 C-suite executive, 25 years in corporate financial services and insurance. She calls herself a servant leader. She is a transformational leader, a nonprofit champion. She's a mentor. She's a coach. She's a life changer. She meets people where they are and supports them with every aspect of their journey, primarily in economically underserved communities. She's an advocate. She's brought closer to a family whose ancestors' land was stolen from them over 100 years ago, and that was in 2012. And she's a troubleshooter, facilitating solutions for situational homelessness. I want to read the quote that I got on her bio before I invite her to speak. I believe we are joined in an ancient and eternal union with humanity that cuts across the barriers of time, convention, philosophy, and definition. I believe that we have soul friends or Anamkara in Gaelic. When you find one, you have arrived at that most sacred space, home. Kate, thank you so much for being here. It is my pleasure. It's an honor to be here, Cynthia. Well, uh, I can't wait to get into your story, but I want to start, you know, where I start every show. Where did you grow up? How were you, where did, were you born? And, and what was your life like as a child? Sure. So I was born in Hartford, Connecticut, and I am the daughter of uh, Irish immigrants. Both of my parents grew up in Ireland. My mother was the youngest of 11 on a farm. My father was the middle of nine. They uh, packed one bag, as the story goes. They got on a ship and they came over and they met here in Hartford at an Irish American home because many people just gravitate to cultures they're, they're comfortable with. And they were married and my brother and I appeared. <laughs> and so, you know, as a child, were you interested in helping other people? Yeah. So uh, it, my childhood is we, we came from very meager means. Um, my mother worked. My father worked. My father had three jobs. And I they really it was very important for them, for my brother and I to go to Catholic schools. Um, I never understood why, but it was more important for them to pay for that than it was to own a home. And th what they instilled was discipline and giving back and supporting your community. And so, yes, I did learn that from my parents, but also learned that from the educational opportunities that I got through uh, through those those school systems. Yeah. OK, so tell me how you got into corporate, you know, <laughs> Fortune 500. I mean, how did you move into that arena? This is the best story, Cynthia. <laughs> I went to a private Catholic college that was, I was required to go only to a college that was all girls, right? My 
my parents, my mother particularly was very uh, strict about that. So I went to a small college in Terrytown, New York, which is, it was Marymount College, which is now uh, part of Fordham University. And um, I came home from college after four years and I had a liberal arts degree. I did not know uh, what I wanted to do. I thought about potentially going back to grad school, being a, a child psychologist, that, that appealed to me. Uh, I also loved the law. Um, I loved, I, I interned as a paralegal, but the most important thing to me was singing. I sang in choirs, I cantered in churches. I sang uh, with a coach from the Metropolitan Opera for six months, which is all my parents could afford for a period of time. So when I came home, I thought I was going to have all these choices. Little did I realize that I also had 10 years of student loans to pay off. <laughs> and so yeah. my mother, in her conventional wisdom, said to me, well, you're going to go work at Travelers because it's on the bus line. And there I went. I interviewed. I was turned down four times because I did not have an analytical bone in my body. I was creative liberal arts person. And they were looking for underwriters and actuaries and people like that who are very good with numbers. And that wasn't me. And so finally, I was hired into a customer service position, which I thought, this is good for a few years. It will help me start paying off my bills. And then I will go do what I want. Maybe I'll go uh, to Broadway. Maybe I'll go to Austria and study music more. Uh, and little did Little did I know I would be there 25 years later as uh, running a, a business, uh, being the chief marketing officer uh, for the company and the executive vice president for the foundation. Because foundation and the giving was always there, right there at, at that uh, level. And I found in my corporate world that I was able to use my position for good. And so wow. that also was extraordinarily uh, fulfilling. Well, so the bus line, that's where it started. I, <laughs> I, I, you know, the, the practicality of our parents, right? Exactly. I mean, <laughs> no, no, there's no, no, and nothing except that. I mean, we, I had, we had only one car, so there was, I was going to have to have a car if I was going to work anywhere else. And, um, so there I was getting on the bus with my mother going to work every day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, I, I want to go beyond that but I want to know because in your bio it says you are a wannabe piano bar singer <laughs> that's, what, that's really what I wanted to do and of course my mother said we came to this country so you could have a better life and that generation a better life meant having money being financially secure and that's what her intention was she achieved that goal for me she, yeah. achieved, she was able to achieve her goal for me. Now, it then soon became one of my passions because, again, being involved in a, a corporate uh, type setting was not necessarily my passion, but I found that I could do so much good with it. I could get involved in the community. I could be on nonprofit boards. I could become principal for a day in a public school system. I could do so many things and give back to the community while still being in the fortunate enough position of getting promotions, getting sent back to get a master's degree in economics. That was, they, they really insisted they wanted to let the, the left side of my brain to start working. <laughs> and so, and so the, it worked out. It just worked out. I was able to incorporate some of those dreams into the world that I created for myself. Well, I think that that's really powerful. And and how astute of your mother to understand that women need yes. to be able to take care of themselves and uh, in the world that we live in. Okay, so 25 years goes by. Then what happened? 25 years goes by and I am feeling I'm not challenged anymore. I have... I've come so far. I financially, I am prepared. Uh, my daughter, I was prepared at the time I was a single mom. And I was also at that point taking care of my parents who were retired on social security and pension. That's all they wow. had. Wow. And yeah. so built a house, they moved in with me. 
I was supporting them, supporting my daughter. And at that point, I thought, okay, I've I've arrived at some place. There's a pivotal moment right here. I no longer want to live this life, which was 24-7, international travel, being away from home so much and missing a lot of opportunities quality opportunities with my daughter. And so I, it, again, serendipity, I received a phone call and I never took headhunter phone calls before because I said, I'm, I have no interest in moving anywhere or going to another place. Um, but I took this one and this one was, would you ever consider coming over to the Greater Hartford Arts Council and taking the CEO position? because it was 2009 and what was happening in the world of, in 2009, it was imploding economically. Wow. Now, the company I worked for was absolutely in wonderful shape. Great investment strategy, very conservative. We did not have the situation many companies did. But regardless, I saw this as a challenge. This organization supported 150 arts, culture, and heritage organizations in the greater Hartford community. And these were smaller organizations that would probably no longer exist if the funding, operational funding to turn on the lights was not there. And what is the first thing to go in a recession? The arts, yes. things like the arts, because now we go back to basics. We have to focus on homelessness. We have to focus on, on uh, feeding people. People have lost their jobs. And they've lost their retirement plans. Many of people lost their 401k money. They had to go back to work. So I viewed this as not, it, it was a life-changing shift that I chose. Wow. Yes, it was, a, it was a very, very pivotal moment in my life. Well, I've, you know, my brain is going like in all these different directions. So I'm just going to start in this one place. Mm -hmm. So... In your bio, it says dedicated wife, mother, grandmother, right? Yeah. So I'm assuming someone, a life partner came into this scenario yes, while all I of did, this. Yes, I did have a life partner uh, and we, I was, we were married. We are, we were then divorced 13 years later. Our daughter was six. Um, this is a person in my life who is still, we are still very close. We have we could write a book on a good divorce. Uh, and then um, our daughter uh, was uh, was not, I mean, traumatized, that's a traumatizing situation no matter what. But if you, if you can rise to the occasion above any of the fray and the reason for, um, for separating, uh, we were able to do that together. And that was also a blessing, but also my need, and you, you've seen in my bio, I'm a peacemaker. Mm. I want peace in my life. Um, I fiercely want peace in my life. So having, I, I always use the, the symbolism of the dove and the hawk. I don't know if you've heard of that, but the oh, dove, God. you know, Picasso drew, drew the dove and pen, I think black ink or pencil, the dove of peace. The dove re represents peace. And then the hawk represents a fierceness, right? And the ability to get things done and to drive forward. And for me, those two are combined in, in my heart, in my soul. Uh, I am a peacemaker, but boy, I am fear. I, I am fierce when it comes to making peace. I will give up anything to find that peace. And I will go after anything to find that peace. And I will eliminate obstacles to find that peace. So that's the dove, the dove and the hawk that I believe symbolically I had evolved into. And I grew and continue to grow in wanting to give back. So yes, I was a single mom. I uh, met my now current husband when my daughter was about 12 or 13. And we married when she was 17. So uh, our family, now she is married with her own two children, two daughters, uh, a nine-year-old and a four-year-old. And I am so blessed. This is the best time in my life. Well, that's beautiful to know. And I love a fierce peacemaker. 
I, I, <laughs> a little bit of an oxymoron, yes, but yes, but it's so important. It and is. I think, you know, when you think about it, you know, I don't care what people are going through. A lot of women are fierce in the protection of their children and right. their homes and things. I, I want to go back to your family for a moment yeah. because we are in a country right now that is fiercely divided about immigration. And yet your parents were immigrants and came here and made a life. Tell me how you're navigating feelings around what you're seeing today. Well, that is a, uh, that's a poignant question. Um, I feel that my parents were uh, in at a period of time in the 1940s where their issue was not uh, they they weren't running away from uh, crime or they weren't fearful of their lives. And obviously they didn't have children. They were young. And in Ireland at that time, the eldest son of the family inherited everything. So if you were the eldest son, you inherited the home and everyone else had to figure out what they were going to do. And so my mother being the youngest and female of 11 and my father being the middle of nine, once they got became of age, they had to make decisions. And so their process was very different. They did an application, they had to be sponsored by someone here and they happened to have aunts and uncles who had immigrated before them. These people committed to sponsor them to take financial responsibility for them until they could find their own job. That was their process. They had to wait three or four months. They were not refugees. The situation today, Cynthia, is heartbreaking. And this is, is probably why I continue to focus on helping to rescue people who are motivated themselves to move forward into a better life. Uh, I am not a political person by any means, um, but I feel strongly that uh, we have an obligation in to humanity to consider how can we collectively as as a people as as a this is america this is the you know land of the free home of the brave and we welcome you and i think that many of the people in my generation and maybe younger generations who did not have their their uh, they might have ancestors who immigrated. None of us were were born here. None of us were were native to this uh -huh. land. Met most of us were not native to this land. We all immigrated, different times, different situations. Uh, they, my, in my parents' time, they were looking for work. I would say during the famine in Ireland, uh, that was a different immigration. But you know, people were being, they were refugees at that time. They had no food. They, they had no um, no work. And so they were refugees, but they were still welcomed into this country. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the, the issue today is we are so over inundated um, with people in the rest of the world who are in need. It becomes a very difficult conversation to have. Yeah, well, it does. And though it's really interesting to me because in, in the interviews I've done and in some of the research I've done, a lot of these people want to come to work. They, do. they want to come to make a better life. And so, and we're living in a country where, you know, jobs aren't being filled. And so, you know, how, what, how, what's the, I don't even know the answer to this question, you know, but I love that you're a solution person. Yeah. It's like, it's like, how do we create space for people yeah. that want to work to be able to do that? and not feel like we're so overrun that we can't, that our resources are depleted. So I, it, it's a question in my heart. It, it uh, and fine. yes. Yeah. So and it's a systemic I, problem. This is yes. not, it's a systemic problem that has continued to worsen in our yes. lives. Yes. So in this moment, tell me your biggest passion. Oh, my biggest passion, I would say, is for my granddaughters uh, to uh, to really help them grow up to be strong women with 
a heart of gold. I want them to be fierce, but I want them to be peaceful. Mm. I want them to understand that they are blessed and they, that their, uh, their mission in life in, in, is to be, take, take what they have and give their gifts to the world, share their gifts to the world. They have this running joke uh, that they call me Mimi. And when my older granddaughter, who is is nine, soon to be 10, she's basically pre-teenager, she will say to me, oh, Mimi, you're so peace and love. <laughs> and I say, okay, that's fine. Peace and love is good. Uh, but don't don't mess with that peace and love because then their fierceness will come out. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yes, I think that's my major passion. I also have a passion. I am, and this is something I do on the side. I am, uh, an instructor, professor in a master's of organizational leadership program. Because I think that I, I teach part-time and I believe strongly that young adults today in, in the work environment are missing some very important cues in life. I believe they are missing empathy. Uh, you know, we could talk all day about emotional intelligence. That's a whole topic. Uh, but I believe that they are missing the opportunity to be successful by proving yourself that you can deliver. Wow. You know, it's almost, well, when am I going to, if I get this degree, I'll get a promotion. That's just not true. Doesn't work. Life doesn't work like that. So I find it, I love being able to work with these students to help them become influencers in their own work world and their personal world. I believe that what made me successful of, of all of the things that were surrounding me and people giving me opportunities for which I was blessed, but what made me successful on my own was that, that I delivered. I under-promised and over-delivered every single time. And that is how you become the go-to person. And yeah. I and I enjoy explaining to people how to do that. There is, there is no rocket science here. It's basic logic. You become the go-to person. You solve the problems, become your own leader, lead yourself first. Yeah. You can determine how to become a leader and fit in an organization. I always tell my students, there are no good and bad leaders. We can identify leaders throughout history, but they are leaders. There are good and bad outcomes, but if people are strong enough and willful enough that other people will follow them, then they are leaders. Yeah. That's what that you need to have, but for good, for a good outcome, for the yeah. good of humanity. Yes. Well, and I think that empathy part is important, you know, because mm-hmm. I think, I think some of our young people uh, um, I, I co-teach a class at uh, an engineering school here, and I I feel like they've been bombarded with so much stuff. Yes. And and from war to school shootings to whatever, that they've kind of become numb to feeling. Correct. And if you cannot feel, how does empathy enter? Correct. There's and no room for feeling. That's right. That's right. And so the, that you are a person who wants to invite them into a different kind of leadership, mm-hmm. I think is important because I think the leaders of tomorrow, their openness, their willingness, their caring is going to, it's going to shift the paradigm that we're currently in. Yes, yes I agree. I okay. totally agree. So and beyond that, my passion, I would say, that my grandchildren impacting others uh, through my own wisdom, what I have learned throughout my lifetime. I, and I am still learning. I am a lifelong learner. Um, but I also have a passion for lifting people up who are motivated, but have no have lost an opportunity, have been put in a situation or have arrived in a situation not of their own doing. And we, I cannot do that for masses of people. And I think this is one of the things that what's going on in our world right now, um, and especially in the Middle East, is it it's it's heartbreaking. And to think that what can I do? Well, I may not be able to do anything in that situation, but I can help one family here. Yes. And if everyone thought about helping 
one person supporting them. And, and it, do, it doesn't mean handing them a check. It means staying with them on their journey, getting them the resources that they need, because many people are so overwhelmed with their situation that they cannot possibly look and find resources that they need. So they do need some guidance. And that's where I think the rest of us come in. We are 100%. Absolutely. So, so if I were to ask you to give yourself a title, what would it be? <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, give myself a title. I am... I am a... And this is going to sound very simple, but I am a problem solver uh -huh. at every level. Problem solver, personally, a mediator, somebody who will always look at both sides of the situation. And I will help others solve problems. Uh -huh. I will. So problem solver doesn't sound uh, very exciting, but at the basic <laughs> core that is what I do. And why? Because I love peace. I love seeing people joyful and, and happy. And again, it comes back to that whole being peaceful and I will go to extremes and I will make phone calls to uh, government officials if I need to. I, and I've done this before I have, and I will do whatever I need to do to give somebody the opportunity that they deserve. It's beautiful. Well, I love problem solver. And when I looked at your at your bio, the thing that popped out at me was servant leader. Yeah. So I um how do people find you? Hmm. So interesting. I once had a after I moved on from the, the nonprofit I was working with. Uh, I've since been uh, doing a lot of volunteer work, board work, but also roll up your sleeves work. Um, and those are not with nonprofits that that I believe in. Um, and so how do people find me? Well, my card, I don't have a card. So my card would say, this is my card. <laughs> and it would have my phone number and my email. So I would say my email is probably the best way to find me. I am on LinkedIn as well as uh, LinkedIn. I am as Kathleen Lynch Bolduck. That was the given name uh, my parents gave me, Kathleen. So I am on LinkedIn. Uh, I am on social media as well, other social media. And I can be reached at my Gmail account, which is kath923 at gmail.com. Well, you're inspiring, Kate. <laughs> All of a sudden, the light started coming in here doing something oh, weird. I <laughs> see the aura around you. Yeah, it's like, okay, I don't even know how to fix it. So, oh, well. <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, I asked the same last question of every um, person. Mm -hmm. This show is called Women Awakening. What would you've overcome a lot of obstacles in your life, including breast cancer? Mm -hmm. What would you say is the most important thing for women to know about the importance of their awakening on this planet at this time? I would like women to know that every that they have the power within them, that they do not need to look outside for validation. They need, they have the power within them. And what they need to do is to take that and sprinkle it, sprinkle that stardust wherever they go. And as you do that, you will come across opportunities that are presented to you. Your eyes may see, but you need to have peripheral vision and see around the situation and then dive in and give what you can what you can give that is the most fulfilling thing but know that the power is right here you have the power some people will say well i can't do that you have it you have the power to do good work in this world and you do not need validation by a title or someone else uh, to to identify with well that's beautiful yeah I mean, whoa, what would happen if all the women on the planet understood that they were powerful? Exactly. It would be a game changer. 
Yes, well, thank is. you so much for being here. I'm, I I loved our conversation. I love who you are and your mission on this planet and uh, grateful that you came. Thank you so much, Cynthia. It was my pleasure. Thank you. All right, ladies. I say the same thing to you every week on some level. You know, I love what Kate just said. The power is within you. If you knew that you came on this planet encoded with everything that you needed to be powerful, dynamic, mighty, successful, joyous, happy, expansive, wow, you would be a game changer beyond anything we could possibly know. So my invitation to you is step into your greatness, step into your power, be a lifelong learner, step out and look for people. I love that she said that your soul friends, <laughs> look for them, connect with them and let's make a difference on the planet. Thank you so much for being here. I love you all. I'll see you soon. Mm -hmm.